Hey, good morning, everybody. Happy Wednesday morning. I think that's what today is. They all sort of blur together, it seems like, anymore. But uh, it has been gorgeous weather here in the Northwest. Hoping for some more of it. Looks like we've got uh, super awesome temps coming up through the rest of the week and the weekend. If you have an opportunity to get outside, this is what you've been waiting for. So, um, hey, we are going through Daniel, as you know, and we're going to be doing Daniel chapter 4, verses 1 through 18. So Daniel 4, 1 through 18. And uh, let me pray and let's jump in. This is a little bit uh, longer chunk of text uh, this morning. Uh, as we're kind of walking through another one of Nebuchadnezzar's dreams and a, a new set of circumstances going on with him. So let me pray, kind of set it up a little bit, and then let's dive in and read and see what we don't learn this morning as we dig into the text. So let's pray. Man, God, we love you. Thank you so much for your word. Just pray that you would continue to guide us, direct us, help us uh, be taught by your scriptures, by your spirit. Um, not only to learn history and events and people and and how they interacted and followed you in the past, but just teach us personally. Um, Lord, use your word to correct us, uh, encourage us, strengthen our faith. And so we just pray that you would uh, help us just continue to become more like your son. Let's pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So <clears throat> Daniel chapter four, let's jump in goes like uh, this. Daniel chapter 4, it says, King Nebuchadnezzar sent his uh, message, excuse me, King Nebuchadnezzar sent this message to the people of every race and nation and language throughout the world. Now, one thing to help us uh, as we're jumping into this one, just a real quick little setup, is that this chapter is going to start with uh, sharing a decree that Nebuchadnezzar sent out. It, he sent it to the whole, the all the known world at the time. It was the same group of people that uh, were all ordered to bow to the statue, and so the same group of people that he had previously communicated with put up this crazy huge statue. Now he's sending out a new message later, some time later, uh, with a new decree. And so the way this chapter starts off, just so you can sort of follow it, is he sends out this decree, and then it's sort of like a flashback. And so he starts with the end uh, of this story. He's like, here's what I'm saying. And then he goes on, let me tell you how I came to that point. And then he tells the story that leads up to what brought him to the point where he issued this decree. So that helps, uh, helps you understand this isn't like, him uh, talking about the exact same dream that Daniel had already interpreted. This is a new circumstance later after the statue incident. So, all right, here we go. Goes like this. Um, so he sent a message to the people of every race and nation and language throughout the world. Peace and prosperity to you. I want you all to know about the miraculous signs and wonders of the most high God has performed for me. How great are his signs, how powerful his wonders, his kingdom will last forever, his rule through all generations. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was living in my palace in comfort and prosperity. But one night I had a dream that frightened me. <clears throat> I saw visions that terrified me as I lay in my bed. So I issued an order calling in all the wise men of Babylon so they could tell me what my dream meant. When all the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and fortune tellers came in, I told them the dream, but they could not tell me what it meant. At last, Daniel came in before me, and I told him the dream. He was named Belteshazzar, after my God, and the spirit of the holy gods is in him. I said to him, Belteshazzar, chief of the mag magicians, I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you, and that no mystery is too great for you to solve. Now tell me what my dream means. While I was lying in my bed, this is what I dreamed. I saw a large tree in the middle of the earth, and the tree grew very uh, tall and strong, reaching high into the heavens for all the world to see. It had fresh green leaves, and it was loaded with fruit for all to eat. Wild animals 
uh, lived in its shade and birds nested in its branches. All the world was fed from this tree. Then, as I lay there dreaming, I saw a messenger, a holy one, coming down from heaven. And the messenger shouted, Cut off the tree and lop off its branches. Shake off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Chase the wild animals from its shade and the birds from its branches. But leave the stump and the roots and in the ground. Bound with a band of iron and bronze and surrounded by tender grass. Now let him be drenched with the drew dew of heaven and let him live with the wild animals among the plants of the field for seven periods of time let him have the mind of a wild animal instead of the mind of a human for this has been decreed by the messengers it is commanded by the holy ones so that everyone may know that the most high god rules over the kingdoms of the world he gives them to anyone he chooses even to the lowliest of people Belteshazzar, that was the dream that I, King Nebuchadnezzar, had. Now tell me what it means, for none of the wise men of my kingdom can do so. But you can tell me, because the spirit of the holy gods is in you. All right. So, that's Daniel chapter 4, 1 through 18. And there's all kinds of cool stuff going on in here. Way more than we can really all uh, dig into and unpack this morning. But some of the things I just want to make sure and highlight is just to reiterate, this is not a retelling of the earlier dream. This is a new dream. And I think what is really interesting is uh, Nebuchadnezzar seems to be just so hard headed and stubborn when it comes to really uh, embracing fully and acknowledging God and God alone. Um, he continues to just see God as one more god in the pantheon of uh, many gods that he uh, had learned about as he grew up and that he was aware of. And what's again, what's interesting is even after Daniel had interpreted his dream the first time, and he didn't tell him what the dream was, Daniel actually told him, hey, here's what you dreamed, which is phenomenal. And obviously, credits uh, God's intervention to provide that knowledge for him. And then he says, and here's what it means. Now here later on, Nebuchadnezzar gets another dream. And what's the first thing he does? Calls all the regular guys back in again. But this time he tells them up front, here's what it means. And it, 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 I was just kind of curious to me to wonder, like, why would he go about it that way when Daniel was there? And I, I, I don't know if maybe it was just because Daniel was like his safety net where if he didn't like the interpretation that the other guys gave him or it didn't make sense to him, he could always have Daniel as his fallback. Like when all else fails, Daniel probably will know what this means. Um, I'm not sure exactly why he went about it the way he did. It's kind of interesting. But even after all that he had seen with Daniel's interpretation of the dream, God's intervention with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire, and, and Nebuchadnezzar acknowledging like, man, their God's amazing. And again, it was though it was like, it's it's their God. And it's the God of uh, Daniel, Belteshazzar, you know, that. And then later here, now as he goes to to ask Daniel for help to interpret this dream, he he gives some credit to God, but he still highlights, he still goes to on the like kind of give credit to um, the God of the Babylonians that Belteshazzar is the in his namesake, Marduk, right? Like he says, he's like, I know you can do this because this is your name. You're named after one of our gods. And surely the power of the gods, like this great array of gods, is with you. Like he's still seeing God as just one more uh, of many and not really special or unique from all the gods per se. And and so there's that all that kind of interesting stuff going on. And then the dream itself, um, where he talks about uh, really like a tree of life, where the roots are tap deep into the earth into this underground ocean and the the tree branches reach the heavens this is a a really common um 
uh, metaphor that's used in a lot of ancient uh, language uh, and ancient cultures in different regions and different cultures have this uh, tree of life uh, kind of narrative and it often is portrayed as the king is central to the provision you know like the king provides the shelter the shade the fruit, the food, uh, the protection from the weather and the elements like, like, you know, if you're close to the tree, uh, you'll be provided for. Um, you can live in the safety and security of the tree. Um, and so it's always portrayed as the king. And so again, here he's having this dream and uh, it's all about, um, the way Nebuchadnezzar sees himself, that that he's the center of the universe, that he uh, provides the shade, that he provides the fruit, that he provides the safety and the security. And we're going to see in the next couple of days that uh, Neb gets a rude awakening and goes through a process of learning that um, he's not really as in control or powerful um, as he thinks he is. And he's about to come to terms with the fact that the God of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel is not just one of the many gods. He is the most high true God. And so that's pretty interesting stuff. Um, so that's kind of the stuff that was sticking out to me. The thing that I, you know, I just, you can't help but think like how stubborn and hard hearted is uh, Nebuchadnezzar, like how how much do you have to see before you actually acknowledge that God is God, right? Like there's there's something supernatural and amazing. And, and I think like a lot of us, it's easy to see and hear stories of God doing amazing things in other people's lives, even if you're a witness to it. And it's like, man, that's pretty amazing. And you sort of can't really dismiss it that it's not a profound amazing thing that happened but somehow it's still not the same as personally experiencing kind of god's miraculous intervention and provision or power in your own life personally and there's there just there's something about um personally putting your faith in god and recognizing that god's at work in your life that is different than seeing God work in the lives of people around you. And and I think particularly for people who are able to take care of themselves, who are by the standards of most of the world wealthy, um, they can feed themselves, clothe themselves, they can provide a home for their family, they've got a car to drive, they've got a paycheck coming in. If they get sick, there's a doctor to go to. Like They basically have kind of life sorted out. And they can um, kind of like be their own little tree of life, right? Like, you know, un I kind of put my roots down and grew and I can provide for myself. I can take care of myself. The people around me I can take care of. Um, I can help support and, and provide safety and security for them. And there's sort of becomes this sense of, you know, kind of independence that like, I can do this. I've got this. I can, I can kind of be in charge of my own life and run my own show and things are fine. You know, we've got our ups and downs, but, but I'm okay. And in a world like that, it's just, I think it's easy to slip into the same um, way of thinking as Nebuchadnezzar that like we're kind of our own little mini tree of life. We can sort of take care of things on our own and, and not really acknowledge and take to heart the amazing things that God's doing in the lives of people around us. Um, just this week, there's the amazing, amazing, just this, this last week, the amazing, miraculous story of the little guy in our community here over in, in Troy, uh, who uh, drowned in a pond, two years old. Uh, there's absolutely nothing about that story and the instance that happened that says that that little guy should be alive. And, and if he was alive, in every instance, every doctor, Everybody that has any experience would tell you that best case scenario, he would have been a, a vegetable, just like brain dead. There's just no way that he survives. And that's just a, a huge testimony to um, 
just God's absolute miraculous intervention. The, um, I know for sure the grandparents go to the Moscow real life and a lot of people know them and, and just the amount of people that immediately rallied and started praying for him. Uh, I love the fact that even in the Moscow news, uh, in the paper, it, the headline is, um, Mother's Day miracle. You know, that this little guy woke up after drowning, essentially dying, being on life support, heart flighted, all of the stuff that went on, and he wakes up and, and according to the story, he says the first thing out of his mouth was he wanted to know if he could have some chocolate. I just about guarantee that kid's going to get as much chocolate as mom can give him right now. Um, just amazing, amazing testimony. And when you hear those stories, you just can't help but acknowledge God's miraculous intervention. Like, how's that any different than the story of God, like rescuing people from a fire that by all means, all reason says they should have burned up, but they didn't. And so there's just, there's stories like that over and over and over again. And we're hearing great reports about uh, little Evan, Chris and Mariah's son that just had uh, at five months old, open heart surgery and his heart sort of rebuilt and rerouted to have parts of it do things they weren't designed to do, but they know how to readjust and make valves work differently to get blood to the right parts of his body because it didn't grow properly. I mean, just amazing, crazy stuff that is so complex and so complicated on a five month old baby. And the kinds of the, the, the risk factors involved are incredible. And, and he is He's done amazingly well through the whole surgery, and not only amazingly well, but he's awake and alert and breathing on his own way sooner than anybody ever has at this age from that type of surgery. He's recovering quicker than anybody ever expected. His eyes are bright, his color's good. Like, it's just so obvious when God is doing miraculous things. Um, and I just, I would just encourage us, uh, myself, just as I'm saying this, just reminding myself and all of us to, when we see those things and we hear those stories, to stop and soak them up and to acknowledge, like, our God is an amazing God. Like, don't let the, the God of the fiery furnace, the God that does miraculous things in someone else's life, don't let those things pass you by and not bolster your faith and and strengthen your resolve and belief in the one true God. Just because it didn't happen to you, don't discredit um, the amazing works of God around us. Um, lest we become like Nebuchadnezzar and not too long down the road, here we are back to thinking we're the center of the universe and we're doing all this on our own. And isn't that always kind of the risk? So that's the stuff that was sticking out to me this morning. Um, Oh, I don't know where I did with my phone. So guess what? I don't know who's on here today, but if you are on today, um, make sure you drop some comments. Let us know where you're watching from. If you've never commented before, today is the day. Open up the video on Facebook, drop a comment. Let us know where you're watching from. Let us know how long you've been watching. A lot of people I know watch on the replay. If you catch this later on the replay, just throw in a hashtag replay and let us know that you're watching later in the day. Um, I love jumping in the comments, interacting with everybody. Uh, a lot of times there's prayer requests going on. There's encouragement going on between people that are watching. There's uh, a lots of uh, just good old fashioned virtual hugs and high fives and greetings and checking up on each other. And so I would just uh, encourage you to come uh, out of the anonymous watching from a distance and uh, and actually plug in and comment and uh, jump in to the community instead of just watching from afar. So, hey, let me pray for us and get us running for this, uh, this Wednesday. Man, Lord, we love you. Thank you so much for your word. Thanks so much for this story again and, and the scriptures this morning and Daniel, that Lord, we get to see how... Um, you just continue to miraculously reveal yourself and and um and oftentimes it, it seems like it, you're so subtle in the way you're involved in the world around us and then other times it's just great big old things like rescuing people from a fiery furnace or bringing a drowned toddler back to life or or holding in your hand the health and welfare of a five-month-old baby through a open heart surgery just the amazing things you do god i just pray that we don't miss those things 
and we don't miss the opportunity to give you glory and praise and credit for them. And I pray that, uh, Lord, they just strengthen our faith and embolden us to believe in you evermore. And so we love you. Just pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. You guys are awesome. Coincidentally, keep praying for little Evan. He's uh, still healing. And, and for this uh, little miracle guy that's uh, on the mend in Spokane after this crazy drowning incident. So those are a couple of little guys in our own community here that we can lift up and ask God to continue to provide and heal and, and uh, tell their story to the people around them. So have a great day. See you tomorrow morning.